I think we'll give another minute and it'll be good if that's fine. Wonderful. So I think we'll go ahead and get started. Sorry about the technical difficulties, but we're glad uh, people were able to find a link and join us. So uh, welcome to APSA's first interactive session of the 2021-2022 uh, academic year. We're super excited to host uh, tonight's session with our current students, our amazing panelists, uh, to answer some general questions that people might have about the MDDO PhD application process. So we'll go ahead and start with introductions. Uh, we'll have the panelists introduce themselves brief briefly um, Jerome, uh, would you like to go first? Sure, thank you. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Jerome Arsenault. I am a seventh year MD PhD student, so I am in the fifth year of grad school. Um, I am a student at Meharry Medical College, but I conduct my research in Rebecca Erie's lab at Vanderbilt University. And my research is using imaging mass cytometry to elucidate the composition and organization of tissue samples from patients with intractable epilepsy due to various mutations in the mTOR pathway. Maya, do you want to go next? Yeah. Hi, everyone. I'm Maya Blake. Um, I am a DO PhD student at Michigan State University. Um, and I am a fifth year, entering fifth year. So we do things a little differently than um, the classic MD PhD programs, but I'm currently in my second year of, or third year of grad school, sorry. Um, and my research is in applied immunology and specifically how genetic polymorphisms increase susceptibility to multiple sclerosis and then ways that we can use the immune system to better treat the disease. Um, and when I'm done, I would like to pursue pediatric oncology. I think I'm next, yes? Okay, so my name is Ike Chinyura. I am currently a fifth year in the PhD student at the University of Arizona in Tucson. Um, on my third year clerkships now, and uh, yeah, I study in my PhD, I studied the um, mechanisms or underpinnings of re-entrant ventricular tachycardia and re-entrant arrhythmias and evaluated novel biomaterial interventions that hopefully one day will serve as adjuncts to pharmacokinetic therapies and, and ablation radiofrequency and all that kind of stuff. So yeah, happy to answer any questions. Thanks for having me. Hi, I think I'm next. Um, my name is Maria Hudak. I am a current third year MD PhD, which means I'm just about to start um, in my lab. I'm super excited about it. Um, I'm uh, at Columbia and um, I am going to start my work in lung tissue engineering, although I have an interest in tissue engineering more broadly. Um, and uh, but I'm super excited about this lung project. <laughs> and um, uh, my clinical interests are neurology and oncology. Hi, my name is Molly. I am a seventh year MD-PhD student at Oregon Health and Science University. I did my PhD in behavioral and systems neuroscience, looking at the intergenerational transmission of childhood maltreatment using neuroimaging. And I'm currently an M3, so back on the wards, thinking that I'm probably gonna apply into child and adolescent psychiatry. 
Wonderful. So thank you all for um, introducing yourselves. And most importantly, thank you all for uh, being here. We're super grateful that all of you uh, took the time out of what I'm sure is your very busy day uh, to join us here to give us some of your wisdom and pearls uh, about the entire MD DO PhD application process. So uh, my name is Kevin, and I'll be helping moderate uh, this panel today. Uh, I'm a first year MD PhD student at Vanderbilt. Um, so just started a few weeks ago, not too long. Um, and also in the chat box uh, helping us will be Ryland and Eli, who are also both uh, first year MD PhD students. So for those of us that have questions, uh, some of you had already submitted your questions uh, to us ahead of time when you registered. So we'll uh, ask those. And for the rest of the uh, people, feel free to put them into the chat. And we'll make sure we get to as many of them as we can. And so for those of you who may be stepping away or uh, may miss a piece of tonight's meeting, uh, we'll have this recorded. And so uh, we will send that out um, afterwards with the link too. And if you have any questions, uh, feel free, as I said, to put them into the chat box. You can also ask us on our Twitter account or by uh, emailing ryan.mortlock uh, at physicianscientist.org. And so I think that's all we have for now. So let's go ahead and actually start and dive into the panel with the first round of questions. Um, any of our panelists can feel free to jump in throughout. But the first question that a lot of students actually asked uh, was how did all of you get into medicine and research and what really drove all of you uh, to pursue an MD, PhD? Uh, I guess I can go first. Um, so, in terms of medicine, uh, I don't really have like that stereotypical, oh, this is the moment I knew that I wanted to be a physician. I've just always wanted to be a physician. Um, but I will say that there have been a lot of experiences that I've had that have sort of solidified that I am meant to be a physician. Um, one of which is that my grandmother battled cancer for numerous years and just seeing some of the things that she went through really made me want to care for others the way that I cared for her. Um, in terms of pursuing a PhD, I did research from sophomore year until I graduated college. It wasn't super extensive, which is one thing I wish I had done, but I really enjoyed the types of questions that I was trying to answer. So during my undergrad years, I worked in a synthetic chemistry lab. My major was biochemistry. So we were looking at perfecting a drug delivery system for cancer therapeutics using targeted therapy. So I really enjoyed that. And I thought, oh, well, I why not do both? Uh, when I discovered that you could do an MD PhD, I said, well, why not do both? It wasn't until I got into medical school that I actually decided to pursue my PhD in neuroscience after I took uh, a neuroscience course in medical school. Um, and I forgot to mention it, but I'm also interested in neurosurgical oncology. So I wanna pursue a residency in neurosurgery. And so when I thought about that, I was like, well, it just makes sense for me to pursue a PhD in neuroscience. So that way I can hopefully do more translational research. Um, but yeah. I had a very non-traditional path. I um, thought I was going to be an actress and I went to NYU and studied at Tisch School of the Arts to be an actress. And then my senior year, I took a class in neuroscience and had a similar experience to Jerome where I was like, this is the coolest thing. Why would anyone do anything else in the world? Because neuroscience is the best. Um, senior year of college is kind of the worst time to decide you wanna be pre-med. Uh, so I started volunteering at a hospital to see what I thought about medicine and also started doing all of the post back coursework, which took five years because I was working full time to pay off student loans and really loved the research that I was doing um, and just decided uh, eventually to do MD PhD. I will say I applied several times MD only because I didn't think I was good enough to apply to an MD PhD program. So one of the points that I hope people take away from today's conversation is don't take yourself out of the running. Let other people tell you no. Don't tell yourself no. I'm really good at telling myself I'm not good enough and not even putting myself out there. And there are going to be plenty of people to do that. So always put yourself out there. That's awesome advice. Um, I had kind of a similar um, introduction into medicine and then deciding to do a DO PhD 
um, where I graduated from college and honestly like did not really know <laughs> what I was going to do. And I got really lucky in getting a lab technician job um, because I had a major in biochemistry and I'd always been interested in medical school, but I just, you know, hadn't like fully committed. Um, and then through a lot of like personal experience with various doctors, including MD, PhDs, I just saw that I thought having both degrees, like an MD and a PhD, um, really made you like the best doctor possible because they knew so much more about the science. They knew so much more about the research and it just brought so many more options to patients. Um, and so really through personal experience, I more so was like, I want to do that. And then for the next few years worked and then, you know, decided to take MCAT and apply and all that. So it's never too late also, I think like, um, you know, if you're not exactly where you want to be with your applications and um, all your experiences right now, it's never too late to just keep working on that and then apply when you're ready and when you think you could, you know, be a great applicant. My experience was a little, I mean, similar in, in the regards of, you know, of the aha moment where you're willing to do whatever it takes to get in. I um, was interested in medical school from the jump. In uh, late high school, took anatomy and physiology and realized that was my jam. One of the few, few people walking into that class smiling every day because I loved memorizing, I loved studying the body. Uh, and after I came to the U of A, I had the opportunity to see research firsthand. I didn't really get it. I didn't quite understand the stress, the tired grad students who taught in the mornings and then stayed up all night in their labs and the professors who were super excited about their work but not excited about other people's work. I, I, didn't, I didn't get the whole scene. So um, after trying on a few different gigs, I realized that it was the research that the professors and the grad students were, that it was their research that one day in the future would be written in a textbook. And it's that textbook that would then be taught to undergrads like me. And I real I connected all the dots. So that was when I had the, the aha moment of, wow, MD PhD would be a really unique experience to be able to combine, you know, what, I mean, you, as a physician, you're a clinician, you're one of the, you, you work as a part of a team depending on how you view the medical system, maybe you stay at the top of the team, but with a PhD, you're really equipped to answer questions outside of the medical system, but in a very applied way. So that, I think that was how, how I kind of came into, into this mindset. I think I'm the last person. Um, I think my path probably followed the trends of kind of starting with medicine and moving forward. But um, I guess where everything started for me was I, I grew up in a really rural area. Um, there was like 3000 people in my town. So like, it's not the middle of nowhere, but it's pretty darn close. <laughs> and um, I, growing up in that area, I had no concept of what research was, um, or that it was a career at all. I knew that there was hospitals where doctors, nurses, PAs worked, but that was pretty much all I knew. Um, that and biology teacher was my only concept of what a career in science could be. Um, so I kind of always assumed that I would try to go to medical school. Um, and that was, but I remember from a pretty young age being interested in, um, I was like, well, people who are paralyzed, like, why can't we fix that? Who fixes that? Did neurosurgeons invent surgeries to fix that kind of thing? And, and that fascinated me. And I, I wanted to be a neurosurgeon so I could make some new material or invent a surgery. I don't know how I thought that worked, but um, <laughs> to, to fix paralysis and stuff and to fix those problems we hadn't addressed yet. So it wasn't actually until I went to college or when I started touring colleges that I learned that engineers did more than drive trains. Um, <laughs> and uh, I, <laughs> I learned what biomedical engineering was and learned that this entire field basically existed to do what I wanted to actually do. Um, and I fell in love with biomedical engineering and thought that maybe that's where my career would be. Um, but like both me and my parents didn't really have a good understanding of what a PhD was and 
whether you could get a job with that. <laughs> so um, I kind of continued preparing for medical school, but as I learned more and more about like, yeah, this whole research thing is a viable career. Maybe that's actually what I prefer. I spent more and more time doing research, but um, ultimately realized that flasks of cells are just not as personable um, <laughs> and talkative as real people. And that uh, what, I, what I did love, the only thing that I couldn't get out of my research was conversations with people, um, especially the long-term relationships, especially about the hard stuff. Um, and after spending a couple months shadowing in hematology, oncology, um, I, I realized that I, I wanted that. Um, so while I think my scientific satisfaction comes entirely from my research, I love my research more than anything. Um, I also can't part with the conversation side of things. And medicine is also really fascinating. Um, but yeah, so that's how I kind of decided you got to do both. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you all. It's really cool hearing how all of your stories, how some of you took the more traditional path and some of you uh, complete this. That's super neat to hear both sides uh, of that story. We have someone who put a question um, into the chat and I think, yeah, Drum's asking if that's for everyone. So in the meanwhile, as we sort that out, we have another question somebody else had submitted earlier uh, as he registered. So we're currently in the thick of application cycle. A lot of people are, um, you know, as I'm sure as many of you remember, a lot of fun times. So um, people are asking, you know, and wondering what was probably the biggest hardship uh, you guys faced through the application process and what's something about the process that all of you wish you had known before applying or maybe while you were applying uh, through the cycle there? Okay, I have something that immediately comes to mind. <laughs> um, so the this application cycle is kind of a challenge to your confidence and belief in yourself in a little in little ways. At least that's how I felt going through it. Where you're like, am I going to be good enough? I'm not good enough. Like, do I shoot my shot? Am I being too cocky? Like, you know, like kind of. And and I think that like I really, um, I really didn't believe in myself at all and like kind of was just not going to apply to anything other than my undergraduate um, until the academic advisors were like, maybe you should pick a few more schools. <laughs> and I'm like, by the way, why don't you look at Columbia? Cause that's like the research that you dream of doing. That's, they have a program that does exactly what you're looking for. And I was like, no. I'll never, uh, you know, I, I assumed automatically that I would never get in there. And um, there was Columbia and one other school that uh, I, I, the research was just beyond my wildest dreams. And I ended up applying to Columbia because it happened to be the first secondary I got back. And so it was the first one I submitted. Um, and I just kind of was like, you know what, I'll never get in here, but um, it would mean the world to me to meet this particular researcher. And that's all I want. Um, and, you know, I was just hoping for the interview and assumed I, that would be it. Um, and then somebody came along and I went to a panel kind of like this, except he was like at my undergraduate. And I met someone who had left the school and was then in like their seventh year of their MD PhD. And they came back and they were talking about things and they were like, yeah, you know, it's incredibly competitive. You'll probably never get in unless you have a first author paper coming out of undergraduate. I had one. And so therefore... I got in, my program director says that they don't even look at people who don't have first author, like first author papers coming out of MDP, out of undergraduate. And I was like, I didn't have any papers. And like my greatest hope of getting on a paper was eighth author. <laughs> um, and just so you know, I still don't have any papers. <laughs> um, and uh, that really disheartened me. And I, I had gotten these secondaries back from other schools that I dreamed of going to, but I didn't submit them because I was like, I don't have a chance, like, you know, and it worked out well in the end because I think that I couldn't be happier with where I am and the, the person who I'll end up working for, but don't let anyone do that to you, no matter what it's publications, anything, like this is not the time <laughs> to listen to external influences who may prematurely disqualify you um, because th this is the time to shoot your shot and you are worthy you're going to feel unworthy. <laughs> it does it to all of us, but no matter what, whatever you're thinking, no matter what you may deep down believe, put your fears aside for now and shoot your shot because it, it can be very worth it. And even if it doesn't work out this time, it doesn't have to work out the first time either. So 
um, that's what that's what I wanted to say. <laughs> I love that. Thank you so much for sharing your story, Maria. Um, so I had a really non-traditional route. Um, one of the things I wish I would have known is that it's okay to be a non-traditional student and to take the time to beef up your application if need be. So I started applying to medical school uh, during my senior year of undergrad, took the MCAT, got an okay score on the old scoring system and was like, I'm just going to do it. But I was very naive. And I was like, I'm only going to apply to places where I want to live. I want to get out of the South and I want to spread my wings and go. I don't recommend that. Um, you need to be very realistic. And what I mean by that is look at the stats of where you are applying and see where you measure. Like Maria sort of mentioned, like you can definitely have those where you're shooting for the stars and you can land on the moon, but you wanna be realistic. And I definitely wasn't. So my first time that I applied to medical school, I did not get in. I got three interviews and I was waitlisted, I believe at my home institution and rejected everywhere else. So I was forced to take a gap year and it was honestly one of the best experiences because when I was in undergrad, I was a double major for two and a half years in biomedical engineering and biochemistry. So I was very burnt out. And I do not think that I would be doing as well as I have been if I had gone into medical school right out of college. So I applied the second time, I was more realistic. And I looked at the metrics that certain schools requested and then what I had, and I planned accordingly. I obviously had some of my dream schools and some of them were in places where I hoped to live, but there were others that were more realistic. Um, I applied again and I was waitlisted at my current institution, so Meharry Medical College, and I was rejected everywhere else. So I was already gearing up to have to possibly take the MCAT again and do a better score. So I was starting to study. And then May 12th of 2015, I got my acceptance. And within two weeks, I quit my job, I moved to Nashville, and I started medical school. And I say all of that, just to say, first of all, it's okay. It's okay for you to take the time you need to create this holistic application and make sure that you are a strong applicant. Because moving forward, that's what you're going to be doing for the remainder of your life, whether it's applying to grants and making sure that your bio sketch accurately reflects who you are, or when you talk about applying to residency and making sure that that application is well suited. So um, that would be one thing. And I guess the only other thing, and I really think, um, and I think that Maria touched on it briefly, was I'm going to use the term imposter syndrome, but, you know, not feeling like you're good enough. Know that you are. And I think that Molly also mentioned it and the fact, like, don't count yourself out. Let someone else do that because you're going to get plenty of no's throughout this career that you may choose to go down and there's no need for you to like let yourself down which I struggle with it all the time but I guess I'll I know we, people have already submitted primary applications and are probably in the midst of secondary applications. So in terms of advice, I think for this part of the process, you're gonna be interviewing, you're gonna be looking at places. Um, and I think it's really important to realize you're interviewing the schools as much as they're interviewing you. I think we all go into it like, oh, they're judging me or they're trying to figure out if I'm, I'm a good fit. You're also trying to figure out if schools are a good fit for you. And so, own that and, and go in with that confidence that you're interviewing them, you're getting a sense of then. And also think about um, one of the things I, I thought about when I was applying to programs is, and I'm sorry to use, I'm going to use a baseball term because I like baseball, but think about how deep the bench is. So things happen, you do med school, and then you start your, your research program. 
and you're interviewing a year before you even start. So if a training grant goes away or someone doesn't get an R01 or someone leaves the institution, then, and you only have one or two researchers you want to work with, then a lot can change. So have a list of people that you want to work with at each program, just so that you know you're going to be happy there no matter what happens. Excellent. Speaking about interviews, um, for the sake of time, we'll move on to another question that someone had asked um, in the chat was, if any, if any of you remember back to your interview season, um, how did some of you prepare for interviews? And did you find any questions uh, did you find valuable in asking faculty or current students during interviews? I know it may have been a little while since some of you have gone through the interview process, but um, any tips or tricks for us there that we can maybe learn from? I don't know um, if it, everyone else had the same experience, but at least when interviewing for the more um, like PhD side of things, because at MSU, we have to interview for both the medical school and the PhD program and the combined. <laughs> so at least when I was interviewing for the PhD and the combined, um, I think just talking to people about research, like showing that you're interested, showing that you've looked into what they've done and that you think this is cool and you have maybe a question about what they did here or why. Um, I think that really shows like a lot of initiative and exactly what they're looking for in students. Um, and then for the medical side, I honestly really prepared for it very similar to like a, um, job that you like really really want like a dream career or something well, I guess that's what it is but um dream job um just like practice honestly at least that helped me just to um you know prepare in advance like what points you really want to get across and how you want to make yourself how you want to put your best foot forward and like show yourself um the way you want to be seen I guess I would agree with all that. And in my experience, finding uh, family members, although you may have to be a little bit more cautious with something like that, maybe like your twice removed cousin, like someone who's far enough away from your direct life to be able to evaluate your tone and the rate at which you're speaking and you know all, all the things that go into being a good interviewee is helpful. Uh, in my case, I asked the one of the deans of the Honors College to help me both with writing statements and also interviewing because she, so, you know, someone in that position has to meet a lot of new people and has to, you know, understands the subtleties of being a good interviewer and a good interviewee. So um, finding those in your life, whether it's through academia, through your lab, maybe your PI or one of your PI's colleagues, family members, um, get as many people to look at statements and to hear you speak about your research and your passion and your interests because that will help you not only convince yourself that you're actually doing it you're actually going to interview you're saying the right things but you'll get valuable feedback from those who want to see you succeed i agree i love everything that's been said so far and agree with a lot of it i think um well all of it um i think another good thing is if you don't necessarily have easy access to someone who you think would be good to practice with you can interview and then record yourself and watch yourself back um you've probably heard that one before but it's great to see if you have any nervous habits um and what your tone is if you sound too sing-songy or you know when you get nervous or something like that um i actually I was thinking a lot about this because for a friend of mine who's interviewing now or going to be interviewing soon for um, just MD programs um, and uh, thinking back I think that the most helpful thing I did for myself was um, this is like I feel like it's cheating a little bit but <laughs> but um, I, what I, I did before every interview was I typed up lists of questions I printed them off and I folded them and I put them in my purse and in between, because I knew I, when I get nervous, I blank. Um, and in between each interview, I would go to the bathroom or like get, go to the water fountain or something, check on my, on my list, on my purse. Of, and I, I usually had like, I wrote out, um, I had a separate list of questions. So like generic school questions for the med school interviews, because they're like pretty standard. They're pretty 
they're pretty similar from school to school. And then I had like five, the top five questions I wanted to ask each researcher I interviewed with. Um, and, uh, and I think that was really helpful because there's just a lot of times where they're like, any questions? So what more can I tell you about our school? You know, and you're like, and, and you do want to have an answer for those times. It's okay if you don't. It's okay to say like, you know, I think I've had my most important concerns addressed today. We talked, and then I would follow that up with like, just so they know you're not bluffing. I would follow that up with say like, I had a great conversation with so-and-so about this, you know, that's one of the things I've really liked about school so far. And that way you can show like, yeah, I have been like engaging and interested and stuff like that. But honestly, it, yeah, it feels like cheating, but that is what I would recommend to do. Um, and sometimes I separated them by list. I had one sheet for questions for current students, one sheet for questions for administrators of the medical school, and one sheet per interviewer um, with my research specific questions and then my program or department of questions and stuff. If I could double dip, I realize I already spoke, but something came to mind that I wanted to make sure I uh, said. The, it, I think it's important to know exactly what you're bringing to the table, consistent with what both Molly and Jerome and everybody have been saying. Understand your strengths and be aware of your weaknesses. Don't let them hold you back from fully immersing yourself in the process. But um, for example, if, you, if research was a prominent part, which if you're applying MD or DO PhD likely is, uh, even if you don't have a first author publication, if you are on an abstract, you should be able to talk about the details of that study in a sufficient enough way that the interviewer or panel interviewers appreciate you were integral in that study, or you learned a lot, or whatever the case may be. There was some sort of technical, intellectual co contribution to that study, and don't and just knowing the details of your study does not mean you have to understand the entire field. So if, you, if the interview gets to a point where they're asking you questions about things you don't know yet or don't understand, that's okay. It's, in my opinion, it's likely that they're trying to assess that you are willing to acknowledge you don't know everything. So it's a, it goes hand in hand that you want to know what you've done, but you, we're all at the beginning of this lifelong career journey. So there should come a point where you say, I don't know, but I'm very curious on what you're saying and I'm willing to look it up, something to that effect. So. Excellent. So in the next 20 minutes or so, a few more questions that people put in. And for those people who joined late, I know we had some technical issues. Um, don't worry, this is all recorded. So we'll make sure uh, we send this out afterwards. And if you have any more questions, uh, feel free to put them into the chat or message them directly to Ryland or Eli, and we'll make sure we get to them. Uh, but someone else earlier had asked, uh, for those of you who have been on the student side of admissions or have actually interviewed candidates, uh, what are some things that help make those applicants stand out and any advice you'd give them? Uh, so I'm not sure if any of you have actually been on the admission side, if you can give, give us any tips uh, for people applying there. I interview um, OHSU does MMIs and I actually do, I've done interviewing for MMI the past two years. And what, what's been really standing out to me is who comes in with a canned response to those questions um, based on, I, I guess, either looking online or, or other places, and then who actually reads the question and then answers it. And I, you know, we're, we have a rubric and we're looking, we're looking for people who are responding to the prompt and fully responding to the prompt that they're given. And I, I see a lot of students who try to take the prompt and say, I, and try to read into what we're getting at and say, I think this is the tension between X and Y. And, and these are the principles that I would apply. And that's not what they're trying to do. They, they want you to respond to the prompt that you're given. So um, I would just keep that in mind. And the other thing, the great thing with MMIs is you have a ton of them. So if one of them goes poorly, let it go, like wash your hands, wash that off and know that we don't talk to each other and it's gonna get averaged together. And so if you have a bad one or a bad couple of them, it, it's not gonna hurt you and, and just enjoy them and enjoy the, the conversation with the person that's doing the, that was the person that's on the other side. To a certain extent, I think MMIs are to the interviewee's advantage because you get in front of more people who can see you uh, shine in different areas and who have you know different skill sets and different whatever you want to call it, but different personalities. But I, having gone through the MMI process myself when I applied and also being on the interviewer side, 
I can appreciate how disorienting MMI, different MMI questions can be because you're covering a broad range of topics. I would say take as an interviewee, be sure to give yourself enough time, like Molly said, to understand what the prompt is asking. And something that I try to practice myself and I notice when other, uh, when other students do that is if you need a moment to reevaluate where you're taking the MMI conversation, don't be afraid to pause. Don't be afraid to sit, just sit there and ponder to yourself and ask for a moment to clarify your thoughts. All of that shows self-control and that you're aware of what's going on and you're not just letting your emotions get the best of you. So it's, it's a great sign of uh, intellectual and emotional maturity. I would also add outside of when you're truly interviewing like one-on-one -on -one with people or in groups, um, just be cognizant of who you're meeting and that you're, and I'm sure you guys all would be, but be respectful and be kind um, because I know even though I don't interview people directly, I interact with like all the students that come through and they, then my, you know, the program directors always ask me for my feedback on them too. So even though these people, I'm not really interviewing them, I'm kind of getting to know them. Um, so like, I just, I like seeing, you know, genuine people, kind people. Um, yeah, honestly, just like be nice to other people you meet, which I'm sure you all will be. Yeah, I would also add, and this is one of the things that I like very much struggled with during my interviewing, um, with being comfortable with yourself, um, especially if you identify as a marginalized group. Um, you already have to struggle with feeling like and like the other. And then depending on how many of those marginalized groups that you identify with, you may feel that even more. And so for me, when I was interviewing, I did not like MMIs. They made me very uncomfortable. I had to meet new people. And because some of the schools where I interviewed were in the South, I just knew that my personality, my inflections, everything was going to be critiqued and people would look down upon me and that made me very subconscious. So I was the type of person where I just sort of went in in a, in a shell and I only spoke and less spoken to. And that's very detrimental because obviously you don't wanna be disrespectful and overpower everyone when you were interviewing, but if the opportunity presents itself, you definitely do wanna talk during MMIs. Um, so I would say that make sure, just know that you've already gotten the interview and that's the hardest part. So then the next thing is telling them why they need to accept you because you've based, I don't wanna say you've gotten like a conditional acceptance because that's not what it is, but you have somewhat like shown them that you could be a great fit for their program. Now tell them why you are a great fit and you have to have confidence to do that. And I know that that's a lot easier said than done, but I really wish that I had done that. And I think that that may have, you know, increased the number of programs that I had gotten interviews for, as well as acceptances for. Sorry to make that, <laughs> I had like a millionth response, but um, I, I didn't have to go through MMIs and we don't do them here, but um, having, uh, I haven't ever, I'm, I'm not like senior enough in the program to directly interview people, but I do do host most of the interview events. And um, I uh, often host interviewees as like a student host. Um, and in addition, like I've, I have a good deal of interview experience for um, a program that I used to like interview for in undergrad. We had this, I ran, I was part of an organization that ran like a training camp that was like a little research experience. And uh, we interviewed a lot of people and I realized interviewing people there where we just had to like pick 20 out of 200 people that it's really hard to do that. Um, but uh, the differentiating factor is usually passion um, and it doesn't necessarily have to be passionate about the direct topic at hand. Personally, this might just be my bias or what I would like to see if I were an interviewer, but um, in my experience, like it's very, much it's much easier to connect with an interviewee who is excited who shows excitement no matter what that's about like 
I've had some great interviews about scientific topics and I've had, or like ones that I enjoyed. And I don't know that, I don't know that they necessarily went great for me, but, <laughs> but I enjoyed them. And, I, but, you know, and then also ones about like completely um, irrelevant personal things, including like, including like just church, which is something that was important to me uh, that an interviewer brought up and I was surprised. I was like, oh, I thought we weren't supposed to talk about that. <laughs> but uh, I, I think that like, when I host students and stuff too, it, um, I don't really get a warm, fuzzy feeling when I think I, I try to be forgiving and understanding, but some people like don't talk to me at all when I'm hosting them in my house and they're just kind of like on their computer or on their phone or talking to them. I'm like, I get it. You're nervous. But then like other people, um, get excited and they tell me about the basketball team and I don't watch basketball at all. <laughs> and, and they're much more personable people. And I think like, keep in mind too, in medicine, that personable being personable is like, a positive quality um, because you have to get along with a lot of people with your patients. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, like if you're a quiet person, that's okay. If you're not a super big conversation starter, perfectly fine. But um, I would say just don't feel like you have to hold anything back because it's so much easier to like and to get along with people when you know what their personality is, you know what they care about rather than just being like, mm, I don't know, I'm trying to figure it out. Um, but yeah, and, and that can also be showcased through you talking to the other candidates in the room. Like I think of an interviewer, when I walk in to a group of the interviewees and I see like four people having a great conversation and kind of laughing along, it like reflects positively in general because it's like, oh, like these are fun people to get along with getting along. But it's also, it's also okay if you're, I don't let that discourage you if you're like more going to be the quiet person in the room. But yeah, I would just say, don't be afraid to kind of let it loose and, and show your personality, show your excitement, no matter what that's about, um, to interviewees, interviewers, student hosts, everything. Wonderful, thank you all. Uh, for the sake of time, this might be the final question, but we'll see where this brings us. But uh, someone else earlier had also asked, uh, maybe like after an interview process, what communication looked like with the programs you had interviewed with? Do any of you remember? Um, did you like write to them right afterwards? And, and we'll have a separate session later on the psycho, like exactly what like the wait list on that looks like. But there were some uh, people, several people asking um, earlier about like what post interview looked like. Uh, and if any of you had advice for that. Outside of radio silence, in my experience, there wasn't much communication in the post interview uh, phase. I was fortunate enough to have a paper accepted. So for the schools that allowed it, I sent in a little update. I forget the exact term, but basically letting them know that this paper that was listed as like under review on my CV or whatever is my resume had subsequently been accepted. And did it make a difference? It's hard to say, but I just had, you know, I. I I saw it was an option and I, I would have regretted it if I didn't try to do something. So I submitted that in, but you know, in the end, it, it's a lot of waiting, patient waiting. And um, yeah, regardless of the outcome, you have gone through an experience that a lot of people don't have the opportunity to go through and you can uh, take away a lot of powerful things from going through the interview process. So no matter if it's a rejection or an acceptance, you, you still won in that sense. Yeah, I would have to mirror what I said. I didn't even know that that was a possibility to message programs or email programs after the fact. Keep in mind, I interviewed in 2014 and 2015. So that's like almost 10 years ago. Um, so I think that things may have changed and I really hope that they do. Um, I think that it's more like unofficially accepted for you to do that um, like during your residency interviews, um, just to show interest. I think in terms of medical school, you have to think that they get thousands of applications. And so having to field thousands of responses like after your interview is just gonna be difficult, but um, maybe that'll change, I don't know. I had a program coordinator at one of my schools mention um, at the end of the day that some of my, at the end of the two day interview process that some of the people I'd met with thought I would be a really good fit. 
and that if I was interested in that program, I should be very explicit about it in a follow-up email that was sent. And she was like, that was that, that you will send in the next 12 hours. And so if someone gives you that much of a hint and you genuinely want to go to that program, send that email. Um, most programs don't accept follow-up. I found a lot of them will be really clear about what communication they accept and what form they accept it in. So some will say, we'll accept update letters until you've interviewed. Some will say, we'll accept update letters until this date. So just pay attention. And I guess going back even a little bit now, like pre-interview, someone uh, had asked what the experience waiting for interview invites was like coming out. Did all of you, was there like a huge delay from like when you submitted secondaries or did like in invitations start rolling out? Do any of you remember what that whole experience was? So I remember it being super stressful for me last year. I was like, when is this ever gonna happen? Um, maybe if some of you could speak to you know, kind of that waiting process. Yeah, I so I just saw what Molly put in the chat, but I got mine like super late. I think I submitted what you can submit in September and they have to all be in your secondaries have to be in in October or maybe that's your primaries. I can't remember. It's been years since I've done this, but um, like I said, there are some that I was able to get a whole bunch of secondaries. I completed all my secondaries and then I only got like two or three interviews per season and a lot of those happened like before the turn of the year. So like between October and December. And then there was that huge waiting game of we're getting closer and closer to a new academic year. Am I going to be a medical student? And as I stated, you know, my first year, the answer was no, I will not be. So really had to reevaluate my life and see what that gap year was like. But then for my second one, like I said, you know, my school does what's known as a mini academic program for success, which is basically where you do a pass fail program in the summer that sort of allows you to dip your toe into medical school co uh, coursework before you actually start having to take classes for letter grades. So when I got my acceptance, that was less than a week away or excuse me, a month away. So I had a lot to do within that month for me to go because obviously I wanted to be a medical student. I want to be a physician. So when I got my acceptance, I was like, well, here we go. It's time to start this process. So like I said, I put in my two weeks notice that day. Um, and then two weeks after that, I quit and I moved to Nashville. And then I used two weeks, about 10 days to two weeks to give myself an opportunity to grow accustomed to the city, to see how long it would take me to commute from where I was staying to the campus, especially during um, rush hour. So that was like, for me. Um, and then I, I also like the question that Nina posted. So I would like to just like voice that for everyone really quickly. Nina asked, is it safe to discuss struggles with mental health during an interview or application? Um, and I think Molly really touched on this very well. It's a double-edged sword. You have to choose what is important to you. And I was recently um, an organizer for a panel for LGBTQI plus identifying students that are entering the match. And you have to decide what your identity is and how important it is for you to let that be known. Um, during that panel, one of the physicians that um, was on the call said they actually preferred to wait to let their interviewers know that they identified as LGBTQ so that way they could see their guttural reaction to see how responsive or respective they would be to their identity and how supportive they could be. And so I think the same thing could be said for this. You can definitely include it in your applications if that is a core part of who you are and you want to ensure that you are going to be supported. But another way that you could do that is do it and during an interview and let them know that you want to make sure that you feel supported throughout your time in medical school. Because I think we all can attest to doing an MD-PhD program is very 
very stressful and you are going to have some really great highs where you are going to have some abysmal lows and if you want to ensure that your mental well-being is paramount for your institution then you may want to let them know that up front um, I don't say that you need to go super in depth and like go into your life story, but you can say that, you know, you struggle with certain things and you want to know what resources are available to you to ensure that you were able to matriculate throughout their program. Sorry about that, Kevin. No, I'm very glad you touched that. If anyone else wanted to maybe add in uh, anything regarding that question, that is a very good question. Wonderful. Well, just for this, I know we started a little bit late today, but in order to respect everyone's time, I'm sure everyone, all our panelists and everyone else here is super busy. Um, let's start wrapping up here. So I just want to thank everyone uh, for joining our Q&A session today with our amazing uh, current students. Of course, I want to thank our panelists for all their time, all the participants who came to this, uh, who caught that, got that email of the last minute uh, Zoom link switch. And also a lot of people here at APSA, including the APSA Diversity Ad Hoc Committee, our PR Committee, our Partnerships Committee, uh, Gabby, APSA Leadership, uh, everyone who helped put these sessions together uh, to make sure that uh, all of our applicants uh, were able to receive word of this. Uh, we're currently in the process of planning our entire calendar for the upcoming interactive session to best support applicants throughout this application cycle. Uh, so please stay tuned via social media, uh, check out our Twitter, and look out for our emails. Uh, lastly, before we end, we're going to post a link in the chat, uh, which is an opportunity for everyone here, as well as the panelists, uh, to help with a current study about, about uh, first-generation physician scientists. Uh, the purpose of this study is to better understand experiences of physician scientist trainees who identify as first generation, so either first generation family to complete a four year college degree or are the first in their family to pursue a graduate degree uh, throughout the various stages of training. So, uh, whether or not you're interested in pursuing MD, an MDDO PhD or are currently pursuing this degree track, uh, we really appreciate it if you could help us uh, fill out the survey and we will put that link in right now. Eli actually will help us put that in there. But otherwise, other than that, uh, thank you all for coming uh, very much to this. Uh, we will send out a recording for everyone uh, who maybe stepped in late or couldn't make it. But uh, once again, thank you all for doing this. Um, this is very helpful. And I learned a lot too myself, so.